We call it the pedestal convoy, but the Maltese don't. They call it the Santa Maria convoy. It was on their feast day, I suppose, or something like that, because the Maltese are very religious. And we picked up this big convoy, and it, uh, it, it was massive. There was aircraft carriers, there was battleships, cruisers, destroyers. They were going to definitely gonna get this thing in. It was big. And the snoopers, we left it, left at midnight, but I said, but no, Jerry, Jerry knew that some of the stuff come through the straits that, because it couldn't all gone into Gibraltar, then head again. Some, the big convoy itself comes straight through. And that was gone through at night, I would have imagined. But even so, uh, at Jerry Lalina, which is the other side of more, uh, Gibraltar, people would have known something big was happening. The captain of the Indomitable it was a, another officer and, and gentleman. Anyway, the, the, he he um, was a, a gentleman. He used to brief the whole ship's company every Sunday night about what the ship will be doing uh, and promising nothing. But as we approached Gibraltar on the Sunday night, he, spake, he came onto the tannoy and said, um, I wish to talk to you uh, about the uh, the V events, make no more doubts about it. Tomorrow and for the next four or five days, you're going to face the biggest battle you'll ever be involved in. He said, "A lot of us are not going to come back. You know, it's going to be like that." He says, "But I don't want anything that like happening what happened to the Ark Royal." which was lost by bloody inefficiency and, uh, and uh, again, bad uh, CO. He said, there will be no order to, to abandon ship given on this ship tomorrow or any other day. He says, but when the flight deck is awash, you have my permission to leave the ship. We approached Gibraltar, and this is where the beginning of my pedestal story actually starts. We, we got to Gibraltar, and as we got through into the Med, we experienced, one, a hospital ship, all lit up, coming from east to west, coming right through the convoy to the Atlantic. To this day, I don't know whether that was German, English, or French, or what. It just calmly said, beautiful sight, all lit up. Secondly, the sea was covered in masses of little fishing boats, Spanish, with lights on. And of course, both those lots must have reported our presence. They have to, whether you like or not. The Spanish one were reported that to their help to their mainland, who in turn told the Germans. Further in, a, a big plane went over. It was, we didn't know until much later, it was a Vichy airliner flying from Algiers to Vichy, France. You know Vichy, okay. And we did hear eventually that that one reported us. So we were reported by three hostile or friendly uh, people about our convoy. The view was, I mean, for a layman like me, the view of the ships was absolutely fantastic. Because the fortune of the sea was flat. It was not rough. It, 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 we had flat sea in the Atlantic, and of course it was flat in the Mediterranean. And you can see for miles, literally miles, all these ships. It was a beautiful sight. I was very proud to be a member of the Navy. Back now to the night of the 10th, 11th, which remained quiet until 4 o'clock, uh, when an Italian submarine, the first on the list there, whose name is quite unpronounceable, but whose captain was Lieutenant Taggia, uh, detected the convoy, uh, carried out an attack on an aircraft carrier, fired four torpedoes, all of which missed. He was detected, depth charged, uh, went deep, uh, dropped astern of the convoy, uh, surfaced, reported his attack, reported the position, course, and speed, and tagged on behind. At dawn, 
uh, we, the convoy now was well into the med. But the, as far as uh, the convoy knew, there had been no attacks, no losses, although there certainly was an indication of submarines, and every now and again a contact was made and depth charge attacks were carried out. Although out of range of bombers, shadowers soon appeared, and they were with the convoy all day. The shadowers at this stage were JU-88s, unarmed, and flew higher and faster than any of the fleet air armed fighters, and they caused great frustrations during the day because we couldn't get at them. Uh, it was a very hot run that almost ran like a, a race car to schedule day by day. You, you could practically accurately forecast what was involved. And, of course, we also had wonderful awareness of what was probably going to be thrown against us by the enemy from what I believe was the, called the Y service, who would get the message into the ships and to the air crew and the squadrons of aircraft actually taxiing out on the airfields, how many aircraft, what they were, uh, so we could almost forecast their arrival and the reception we were going to get uh, when, the, when they located the convoy, which of course wasn't terribly easy to do. Uh, they knew where we were ultimately aiming. And then starting from Gibraltar, they could almost draw the line that the convoy would be passing down. And it all ran very much to schedule. You would eventually get into the long-distance reconnaissance uh, range of German aircraft and Italian aircraft operating from Sicily and Sardinia. Um, you would eventually get within short range of their airfields in, in those islands and uh, be vulnerable to Stuka attacks and of course there was also the Sicilian narrows that you were forced to go through to get to Malta which was a very narrow stretch of water uh, from the North African coast up to Sicily which was ideal for the laying of mines and the operation of German e-boats and Italian e-boats The first day was quite uneventful. Um, snoopers were sighted, aircraft were spotted, were, were detected, and sometimes it was a bit annoying because there were there were RAF planes which tended to give our position away the convoy if they were being potted elsewhere. If they came too close, we could have had some target practice. But that's beside the point. I'm being a bit facetious. Soon afternoon, uh, furious, uh, not part of the convoy, but almost in sight to the north, flew off the first of her wave of uh, 38 fighters. Uh, one had engine trouble and landed on the Indomitable. The remaining 37 flew the 600 miles to Malta safely, uh, landed, were refueled and dispersed quickly, the lesson having been learned from a previous reinforcement nearly all of which were destroyed by a bombing attack, immediately they landed. While this second launch was in progress, watchers were horrified to see four large explosions along the hull of the Eagle. And... I knew, because I've been speaking to one of the uh, signal ratings, that the Furious were going to fly for Spitfires. I thought I'd go on the upper deck and have a look at this. And so we went up, went up on the upper deck and looked way, way over um, the port side, but she was so far away from us, flying them off, you couldn't see much. I thought, well, you know, not much to see there. And the, the ships, the, the whole convoy was just uh, zigzagging to a certain degree, on the course, which brought the, um, the aircraft carrier Eagle into view. And I thought, well, we thought that she was about to fly off a, a combat air patrol because she had air, aircraft on the aft end warming up. 
and it, she was doing the duty of, of um, air combat air patrol because she had three already up. And um, suddenly there's this terrific cloud of brown smoke from the, from the side of her. And that was the first of the four torpedoes which hit her. And uh, it was shattering, believe you me. Um, and within within two minutes, she's she's over an angle of forty five degrees, and everybody said, "Oh, she's not going to get, she's not going to make it," which is true because in in seven minutes, she's completely gone. Shadowing continued during the afternoon, and attack was certainly expected before nightfall that night. And intelligence was very good, ample warning was given that an attack was coming, and just before dusk, 30 JU-88s, uh, shallow dive bombers, and um, six Heinkel 111s arrived to attack the convoy. Um, the escort had taken, had, had ample warning to get into a, a good station for air attack well out from the main body so that the main body too who did not have its arcs of fire dis distorted and the attack was met by the most massive barrage. Uh, many present who had had plenty of experience of action felt that they had never seen anything like it before and I guess the German pilots felt like that too. Although there were some near misses, indeed uh, the walrus in the cruiser Manchester's hangar uh, was hit by bomb splinters and put out of action, uh, there was no damage and three JU-88s were shot down. Uh, our own fighters, which were airborne, came back uh, when it was really almost dark. And by this time the gunners, particularly in the merchant ships, were ready to fire at anything, and uh, they were horrified to be met by an equal barrage. And indeed, Indomitable had to increase speed to 26 knots and get out clear ahead of the convoy to recover her fighters so that they wouldn't be shot down by her own people. There was so much anti-aircraft fire that you didn't know um, whether you were hitting them or not. I know for a fact that um, even some of our own aircraft from the carriers were shot down by, possibly by the anti-aircraft fire, because it was so heavy. Every ship was using up ammunition so much, and the attacks were so heavy um, that it was impossible to tell. I mean, you saw planes on fire crashing into the sea, and you didn't know whether they were German or British because we had a lot of the fighters up off the carriers to try and help the convoy. I remember one particular thing that happened was that um, the raids went on so late into the evening that um, by the time all the raids were finished, the fighters off the carrier um, had to land in the darkness. And although the uh, enemy was so close, um, we had, they had to switch on their landing lights and the carrier had to illuminate the deck to get the vessel, uh, the aircraft back on board, which was a most unusual thing. Um, Furious was returning to Gibraltar to load another uh, flight of Spitfires, escorted by three destroyers, one of which was Wolverine, uh, captain by uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Peter Gretton. Uh, he got a radar contact at 5,000 yards, uh, steamed towards it, increasing speed. He was delighted to see a submarine on the surface. He increased to full speed, uh, hit the midships, uh, sunk the submarine, and pushed his bows back about 40 feet. Um, it put his ship out of action for some considerable time and made him persona non grata with the Admiral in Gibraltar. 
It didn't do his career much harm because he went on to become one of the greatest escort commanders in the Western approaches and retired as a vice admiral. The convoy had a quiet night, but the next morning the shadowers appeared at first light because not only Lieutenant Tajia and his unpronounceable submarine, uh, uh, but U-73 as well, and U-205, which had uh, not made contact with the convoy, were all tagging along behind and sending out frequent uh, position, course, and speed reports. 